Good Tuesday morning, sweet listening squirrels. Let's get back to our chapter. I'm 21, thank you, and Prince is but a couple of years older, said Mac, promptly resenting the slight put upon his manhood. Yes, but he is like other young men, while you are a dear old bookworm. <laughs> no one would ever mind what you did. So you may go to parties with me every night, and not a word would be said, or if there was, I shouldn't mind since it's only Mac, answered Rose. <coughs> Smiling as she quoted a household phrase often used to excuse his vagaries, vagaries, <laughs> vagaries, vagaries. Then I am nobody, he said, lifting his brows as if the discovery surprised and rather nettled him. Nobody in society as yet, but my very best cousin in private, and I've just proved my regard by making you my confidant and choosing you for my knight, said Rose, hastening to soothe the feelings her careless words seemed to have ruffled slightly. Much good that is likely to do me, grumbled Mac. You ungrateful boy, not to appreciate the honor I've conferred upon you, I know a dozen who would be proud of that place, but you only care for compound fractures. So I won't detain you any longer except to ask if I may consider myself provided with an escort for tomorrow night, said Rose, a trifle hurt at his indifference, for she was not used to refusals. If I may hope for the honor, and rising he made a bow, which was such a capital imitation of Charlie's grand manner that she forgave him at once, exclaiming with amused surprise, Why, Mac, I didn't know you could be so elegant. A fellow can be almost anything he likes if he tries hard enough, he answered, standing very straight and looking so tall and dignified that Rose was quite impressed. And with a stately curt courtesy, she retired, saying graciously, I'll ac I accept with thanks. Good morning, Dr. Alexander Mackenzie Campbell. When Friday evening came and word was sent up that her escort had arrived, Rose ran down, devoutly hoping that he had not he had not come in a velveteen jacket, top boots, black gloves, or made any trifling mistakes of that sort. A young gentleman was standing before the long mirror apparently intent upon the arrangement of his hair, and Rose paused suddenly as her eye went from the glossy broadcloth to the white-gloved hands busy with an unruly lock that would not stay in place. Why, Charlie, I thought she began with an accent of surprise in her voice, but got no further. For the gentleman turned and she beheld Mac in immaculate evening costume with his hair parted sweetly on his brow, a superior posy at his buttonhole and the expression of a martyr on his face. Ah, don't you wish it was? No one but yourself to thank that it isn't he, am I right? Dandy got me up, and he ought to know what is what, demanded Mac, folding his hands and standing as stiff as a ramrod. You are so regularly splendid that I don't know you. Neither do I. I really had no idea you could look so like a gentleman, added Rose, surveying him with great approval. Nor that I could feel so like a fool. Poor boy, he does look rather miserable. What can I do to cheer him up in return for the sacrifice he is making? Stop calling me a boy. It will soothe my agony immensely and give me courage to appear in a low-necked coat and curl on my forehead, for I'm not used to such elegancies, and I find them no end of a trial. Max spoke in such a pathetic tone and gave such a gloomy glare at the aforesaid curl that Rose laughed in his face and added to his woe by handing him her cloak. He surveyed it gravely for a minute and carefully put it on wrong side out and gave the swan's down hood a good pull over the head to the utter destruction of all smoothness to the curls inside. 
Rose uttered a cry and cast off the cloak, bidding him learn to do it properly, which he meekly did, then led her down the hall without walking on her skirts more than three times on the way. But at the door, she discovered that she had forgotten her furred overshoes and bade Mac get them. Never mind, it's not wet, he said, pulling his cap over his eyes and plunging into his coat regardless regardless of the elegancies that afflicted him. But I can't walk on cold stones with thin slippers, can I? began Rose, showing him a little white foot. You needn't, for there you are, my lady, and unceremoniously picking her up, Mac landed her in the carriage before she could say a word. What an escort, she exclaimed in comic dismay as she rescued her delicate dress from a rug in which she was about to tuck her up like a mummy. It's only Mac, so don't mind, and he cast himself into the opposite corner with the air of a man who had nerved himself to the accomplishment of many painful duties and was bound to do them or die. But gentlemen don't catch up ladies like bags of meal and poke them into carriages in this way. It's evident that you need looking after, and it's high time I undertook your society manners. Now do mind what you're about, and don't get yourself or me into a scrape if you can help it, besought Rose, feeling that on many accounts she had gone further and fared worse. I'll behave like a turvy drop, see if I don't. Mac's idea of the immortal Turvy Drop's behavior seemed to be a peculiar one. Turvy Drop? After dancing once with his cousin, he left her to her own devices and soon forgot all about her in a long conversation with Professor Stumpf, the learned geologist. Rose did not care, uh, for one dance proved to her that that branch of Mac's education had been sadly neglected, and she was glad to glide smoothly about with Steve, though he was only an inch or two taller than herself. She had plenty of partners, however, and plenty of chaperones, for all the young men were her most devoted, and all the matrons beamed upon her with maternal benignity. Charlie was not there, for when he found that Rose stood firm and had moreover engaged Mac as a permanency, he would not go at all, and retired in high dudgeon to console himself with more dangerous pastimes. Rose feared it would be so, and even in the midst of the gaiety about her, an anxious mood came over her now and then and made her thoughtful for a moment. She felt her power and wanted to use it wisely, but did not know how to be kind to Charlie without being untrue to herself and giving him false hopes. I wish we were all children again with no hearts to perplex us and no great temptations to try us, she said to herself as she rested a minute in a quiet nook while her partner went to set a glass went to get a glass of water. Right in the midst of this half-sad, half-sentimental reverie, she heard a familiar voice behind her say earnestly, And alophite is the new hydrosilicate of alumina and magnesia, <laughs> much resembling pseudophyte, which Webs Websky found in Cilicia. What is Mac talking about, she thought, and peeping behind a great azalea in full bloom, she saw her cousin in deep conversation with the professor, evidently having a capital time for his face had lost its melancholy expression and was all alive with interest. <laughs> While the elder man was listening as if his remarks were both intelligent and agreeable, what is it? asked Steve, coming up with the water and seeing a smile on Rose's face. She pointed out the scientific tete-a-tete -tete going on behind the azalea, and Steve grinned as he peeped and grew sober, and said in a tone of despair, If you had seen the pains I took with that fella, the patience with which I brushed his wig, 
The time I spent trying to convince him that he must wear thin boots and the fight I had to get him into that coat, you'd understand my feelings when I see him now. Why, what's the matter with him? asked Rose. Will you take a look and see what a spectacle he's made of himself? He'd better be sent home at once or we'll disgrace the family by looking as if, it, as if he'd been in a row. Steve spoke in such a tragic tone that Rose took another peep and did synth sympathize with Dandy, for Mac's elegance was quite gone. His tie was under one ear, his pony hung upside down, his posy. <laughs> his pony. His posy hung upside down, his gloves were rolled into a ball, which he abs absently squeezed and pounded as he talked and his hair looked as if a whirlwind had passed over it, for his ten fingers set it on, and now and, and now and then, as they had a habit of doing when he studied or talked earnestly. But he looked so happy and wide awake in spite of his dishevelment that Rose gave an approving nod and said behind her fan, It is a trying spectacle, Steve, yet yeah, on, on the whole, I think, his own odd ways suit him best, and I fancy we, sh we shall be proud of him, for he knows more than all the rest of us put together. Hear that now. And Rose paused that they might listen to the following burst of eloquence from Mac's lips. You know, friends, always has shown that the globular forms of silicate of bismuth of Schneeberg and Lord help. I cannot pronounce that of the rest somebody's name. Are not isometric but monoclinic in crystalline form and consequently he separates them from the old eulotite and gives them the new name Agricolite. Isn't it awful? Let's get out of this before there's another avalanche or we shall be globular silicates <laughs> and isometric crystals in spite of ourselves, whispered Steve with panic-stricken air. And they fled from the hailstorm of hard words that rattled about their ears, leaving Mac to enjoy himself in his own way. Got my drink and my mouth is so dry. But when Rose was ready to go home and looked about for her escort, he was nowhere to be seen. For the professor had departed and Mac with him, so absorbed in some new topic that he entirely forgot his cousin, and went placidly home, still pondering on the charms of geology. When this pleasing fact dawned upon Rose, her feelings may be imagined. She was both angry and amused it was so like Mac to go mooning off and leave her to fate. Not a hard one, however, for though Steve was gone with Kitty before her plight was discovered, Miss Bliss was only too glad to take the deserted damsel under her wing and bear her safely home. Rose was warming her feet and slipping the chocolate which Phoebe always had ready for her. Sipping. Oh, slipping, sipping. Uh, when a hurried tap came at the long window whence the light streamed in and Max's voice was heard, was heard softly asking to be let in just for one minute. <coughs> Curious to know what had befallen him, Rose bade Phoebe obey his call and the delinquent cavalier appeared, breathless, anxious, and more dilapidated than ever for he had forgotten his overcoat. His tie was at the back of his neck now, and his hair is rampantly erect as if all the winds of heaven had been blowing freely through it, as they had, for he had been tearing to and fro the last half hour, trying to undo the dreadful deed he had so innocently com committed. Don't take any notice of me, for I don't deserve it. I only came to see that you were safe, cousin, and then go hang myself, as Steve advised. He began in a remorseful tone that would have been very effective if he had not been obliged to catch his breath with a comical gasp now and then. 
I never thought you would be the one to desert me, said Rose with a reproachful look, thinking it best not to relent too soon, though she was quite ready to do it when she saw how sincerely distressed he was. It was that confounded man. He was a regular walking encyclopedia, and finding I could get a good deal out of him, I went in for general information as the time was short. You know, I always forget everything else when I get hold of such a fellow. That's evident. I wonder how you came to remember me at all, answered Rose on the brink of a laugh. It was so absurd. I didn't until Steve said something that reminded me. Then it burst upon me in one awful shock that I'd gone and left you and you might have knocked me down with the feathers, said Honest Mac, hiding none of his iniquity. What did you do then? Do? I went off like a shot and never stopped till I reached the hopes. You didn't walk all the way, cried Rose. Bless you, no, I ran, but you were gone with Miss Bliss. So I pelted back again to see with my own eyes that you were safe at home, answered Mac with a sigh of relief, wiping his hot forehead. But it's three miles at least each way and twelve o'clock and dark and cold. Oh, Mac, how could you? exclaimed Rose, suddenly realizing what he had done as she heard his labored breathing, saw the state of the thin boots and detected the absence of an overcoat. Couldn't do less, could I? asked Mac, leaning up against the door and trying not to pant. There was no need of half killing yourself for such a trifle. You might have known I could take care of myself for once at least. With so many friends about. Sit down this minute. Bring another cup, please, Phoebe. This boy isn't going home till he's rested and refreshed. After such a run as that, commanded Rose. Don't be good to me. I'd rather take a scolding than a chair and drink hemlock instead of chocolate if you happen to have any ready, <laughs> answered Mac with a pathetic puff as he subsided onto the sofa and meekly took the draft uh, Phoebe brought him. If you have anything the matter with your heart, sir, a race of this sort might be the death of you. Never do it again, said Rose, offering her fan to cool his heated countenance. Haven't got any heart. Yes, you have, for I hear it beating like a trip hammer, and it's my fault. I ought to have stopped as we went by and told you I was all right. It's the mortification, not the miles, that upsets me. I often take that run for exercise and think nothing of it, but tonight I was so mad I made extra good time, I fancy. Now, don't you worry, but compose your mind and sip your dish of tea, as Evelina says, answered Mac, artfully turning the conversation from himself. What do you know about Evelina? asked Rose in great surprise. All about her. Do you suppose I never read a novel? I thought you read nothing but Greek and Latin with an occasional glance at Webski's pseudophytes and the monoclinics of whatever that name was I couldn't pronounce all ago. Mac opened his eyes wide at this reply, then seemed to see the joke and joined in the laugh which, with, with such heartiness that Aunt Pliny's voice was heard demanding from above with sleepy anxiety, Is the house of fire? <laughs> no, ma'am, everything is safe. I'm only saying good night, answered Mac, diving for his cap. Then go at once and let that child have her sleep, answered the, added the old lady retiring to her bed. Rose ran into the hall and catching up her uncle's fur coat met Mac as he came out of the study absently looking about for his own. You haven't any, you benighted boy, so take this and have your wits about you next time or I won't let you off so easily, she said holding up the heavy garment and peeping over it with no sign of displeasure in her laughing eyes. Next time, then you do forgive me? You'll try me again and give me a chance to prove I'm not a fool, cried Mac, embracing the big coat with emotion. Of course I will. 
and so far from thinking you a fool, I was much impressed with your learning tonight and told Steve we ought to be proud of our philosopher. Learning be hanged. I'll show you that I'm not a bookworm, but as much a man as any of them. And then you may be proud or not. As you like, cried Mac with a defiant nod that caused the glasses to leap wildly off his nose as he called up his hat and departed as he came. A day or two later, Rose went to call upon Aunt Jane, as she dutifully did once or twice a week. On her way upstairs, she heard a singular sound in the drawing room and involuntarily stopped to listen. One, two, three, slide. One, two, three, turn. Now then, come on, said one voice impatiently. It's very easy to say, come on, but what the dickens do I do with my left leg while I'm turning and sliding with my right? demanded another voice in a breathless and mournful tone. Then the whistling and thumping went on more vigorously than before, and Rose, recognizing the voices, peeped through the half-open door to behold a sight which made her shake with suppressed laughter. Steve, with a red tablecloth tied around his waist, languished upon Mac's shoulder. <laughs> I can just see it. Dancing in perfect time to the air, he whistled, for Dandy was proficient in the graceful art and plumed himself upon his skill. Mac, with a flushed face and dizzy eye, clutched his brother by the small of his back, vainly endeavoring to steer him down the long room without entangling his own legs in the tablecloth. It's time for Dana's craft hour. Mm, tackling his own legs and then treading on his partner's toes or colliding with the furniture. It was very droll and Rose enjoyed the spectacle till Mac, in a frantic attempt to swing around, dashed himself against the wall and landed Steve upon the floor. Then it was impossible to restrain her laughter any longer and she walked in upon them saying merrily, It was splendid. Do it again and I'll play for you. Steve sprang up and tore off the tablecloth in great confusion while Max, still rubbing his head, dropped into a chair, trying to look quite calm and cheerful as he gasped out, How are you, cousin? When did you come? John should have told us. I'm glad he didn't, for then I should have missed this touching tableau of cousinly devotion and brotherly love, getting ready for our next party, I see trying to but there's so many things to remember all at once keep time steer straight dodge the petticoats and manage my confounded legs that isn't easy to get on at first answered mac with a sigh of exhaustion lord help <laughs> so dry see how much longer i've got i think i'm gonna have to stop because i want to see There's not a whole bunch more, but more than I can read with a dry as heck mouth. <laughs> okay. So I'll stop there and there will have to be a part three. Y'all have a crafty day and I hope to see you in the YouTube streets. I'm not on live today. Hope to see you right if you catch this around between 9.30 and 11, I'll be over at Dana's Triple C's for her craft hour. It's really a craft hour and a half. Love ya. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.